let's talk about holidays in prison. Because I think the holiday season is difficult for everyone out here in the world. But it's even more difficult for those of us inside. Because we had a good childhood or good memories. We were reminiscing and missing and feeling we had messed up and abandoned those people. And if we didn't, it's that feeling of we never had this. Like, this is a seasonal thing the world experiences that we never understood. And then being locked behind bars, there were other considerations. So there were holiday meals. And this was usually the high point. So for Christmas or for Thanksgiving or for the Eid feast at the end of Ramadan, we would get these meals that were better than anything else the entire year. It's not like it was what you would want to eat on the street. It's not life-changing. But compared to what we're eating on a regular basis, we would look forward to it for weeks and months. Guys would buy these trades because somebody might be strung out on drugs or somebody might just not want to eat it and want to trade it for something else. They would line up these deals to buy a holiday tray a month or two months ahead of time because it was that important of a deal. On the other hand, for the guys who got visits, it was a catch-22. Because you could have your family members come, and under normal operations, at least in Virginia, you had a visit either Saturday or Sunday, and they would usually alternate, depending on the system each prison used. But on holidays, even if it was on a Wednesday, or it was on a Sunday, or whatever, anybody could get a visit. But the problem was, where it was normally divided, where half would have Saturday and half would have Sunday, everybody could come on the holiday. So everybody would get a visit that was able to, which meant your family might drive two hours there, sit outside for two hours waiting to come in, get in, only get the guaranteed hour, and then have to drive home two hours. So if you look at that, that's two hours driving, two hours waiting, two hours driving, and only an hour of visitation. So I would always tell my family, don't come see me on the holidays, come see me the week before or the week after. There's no point in you waiting for all that time. There's no point in you dealing with all this chaos just to see me for an hour. And I think there were one or two holidays where they didn't listen and they came anyways. And honestly, I really appreciated that. I didn't ever want to ask them to do that or inconvenience themselves further because I had put myself in prison. I didn't want them to have to suffer as a result of that. It's one of the reasons that like when they strip searched my grandfather or strip searched other visitors or just put them through hell, it drove me crazy because I had this guilt and the shame that I had put myself in this situation and that now if they wanted to see me and wanted to support me, those were the things they had to put up with. That's why I would always tell them like, hey, if you never come back, I fully understand. I support it. Like it's not going to hurt my feelings. And realistically, it would have hurt my feelings, but I totally would have understood so we have the meals and we have visits. Then the other consideration was whether guys were able to make the holiday special themselves or whether it was just this kind of like crushing, soul-missing thing. And I remember in the honor pod, so when I was at Buckingham Correctional Center, I was there for 13 years. I was there 12 years waiting to get in the honor pod, and I got in for the final year. But this was where they had the dog program. So I would always be excited, and I would always try to find ways to like sneak into the honor pod, not to live there, but just to go play with the dogs. So when I had a job on maintenance, I had a really cool maintenance supervisor, and I would tell him, Hey man, can we go to the honor pod? I'm trying to play with the dog. So we would like find some work order because we always had hundreds of work orders. We would go in there. I would play with the dog. And I remember this one guy it was absolutely amazing. For Christmas, he had his entire door decorated in Christmas. He had like his entire inside of his cell. He had those uh, paper mache, not paper mache, uh, like folded paper uh, snowflakes and all that stuff, like hanging from his ceiling, all the stuff that you couldn't do. Like anywhere else on the compound that would have been contraband, you would have gotten a charge, they would have come in and tore it down. That guy had been there for 30 years. Like they, they just understood who he was. They were like, cool, we'll do your thing. You see other guys make like giant paper mache candy canes or guys would just, it was amazing the artwork that people would come up with. And it's something that I struggle with. I'm out here in the world and I struggle with like buying basic things for myself or, or feeling like I'm in that scarcity mode. And I got myself a little mini Christmas tree for the first time ever. I've never done that. And it was really cool because like I wake up every morning now and I have a little mini Christmas tree and I have lights around it. I don't turn the lights off. Like I, when I get up in the morning, when I come back at night, I want to see those lights because it gives me that little bit of cheer. And guys on the inside would do the same thing. My buddy Graham and ST, they would make these uh, uh, lamps. They would basically build them out of popsicle sticks and then they would stretch paper around them and they would paint murals or paint on the, um, the paper, but it was still clear so you could like see the shine through the design on the wall. So they would do like Oriental ones or they would do Christmas themed ones. And it was always cool to go into somebody's cell who was building a project. And the way that worked is like you weren't allowed to have anything permanently attached. You couldn't have things hanging from your ceiling like the guy in the honor pod did. You couldn't have things on your walls, but you could have arts and crafts projects as long as they were still in, in the process of being made. So once they were made, you had to send them home. So guys would always leave like one corner off so they could say they were still working on them. And again, just going in and seeing that. And that was the way guys supported each other because we all knew we were in this bad place. So sometimes a guy would go around like, I mean, you obviously can't dress like Santa Claus. All you have is like prison clothes. But go, go around with like a pillowcase and just like hand out candy or hand out little stuff because he knew what a difference it would make to people. And that was always what was so inspiring to me. In this like hopeless place, there would be these individuals that would lift other people up. 
who would just find a way to smile and make other people smile and make other people laugh and remember that, you know what, no matter how bad it is, no matter how serious it is, like we've got to get through this. And we might as well get through this with a smile on our face, a little warmth in our heart or some sense of community or connection. And those were really the people that got us through. I remember somebody asked me a long time, like, what's the best thing to be in prison? Do you want to be like big? Do you want to be scary? No, you want to be funny. If you can make people laugh or you can make people feel good in a place that's so hopeless, everybody will love you. Like nobody will ever mess with the funny guy. Nobody will ever mess with the heartwarming, inspiring guy. Nobody will ever mess with the mentor because those are the people who make it doable, who make that time endurable. And not only that, they add value. Like they actually give you something you carry with you. The guy who shares his wisdom or shares his inspiration gives you something. The guy who shares his humor and makes you laugh, he gives you hope to go for it. He gives you something to laugh about and think about for the rest of the day. He takes a little bit of that darkness away, a little bit of that hopelessness away. And those are the guys that I always hope are doing well. And that was what, was what I saw. The holidays brought out the best and the worst in people. We probably had more overdoses and more uh, serious issues and more self-harm around the holidays because guys just felt hopeless and lost and didn't know what they were doing. But we also had more guys showing up and giving things away and, and making holiday meals and sharing and like just being good people, just basically saying, hey, we all got to be in here together. At least we can be a little more comfortable. We can be a little more together. So the holidays in prison were not really fun, but at the same time, sometimes they brought out the funnest moments and the best in people.